So now let's talk about some of the changes that we're expecting to see as climate changes on land. Now one of these changes involves uh, the ocean and so it's mainly going to affect coastal regions and this involves the effects of global warming on sea level. So as sea level rises we can expect uh, more flooding of coastal areas, increased storm surge during uh, storms as are as shown here in this picture. Um, and when we think about uh, sea level rise as a result of warming, there are really two different reasons why we expect sea level to, to increase. Uh, first, there's land-based ice ends up melting and this then runs off into the ocean. So there's the addition of, of water from land-based ice. So sea-based ice isn't going to increase sea level because that water is already there, but stuff on land will lead to an increase. Um, and of course, we're already seeing major losses of ice on land, such as in Greenland. Um, and there's been a huge increase in the rate of ice loss on land that is contributing to sea level rise, which we see occurring already. Now, the second reason that uh, we see sea level rise in response to warming has to do with thermal expansion of the ocean waters. So if you look over here on the right, this graph essentially shows you what the volume uh, of a given amount of, of water is and how that changes with temperature. And so uh, for the most part, as water increases in temperature, it increases in volume. And so as the oceans heat up, even if there was the same amount of water, it would take up more space and that leads to a rise in sea level. And if we look at how sea level has changed along coasts in the United States, you can see that for the most part, uh, the sea level has gone up. There are a few places where it's gone down. Now on this map, we're looking at relative sea level change. So that includes the effects of both rising sea level, but also effects of changing uh, land, coastal land height. Uh, so some areas of the coastline are subsiding, they're sinking, uh, and others are rising up. And some of the places where we see a decline in sea level, relative sea level, are places where tectonic movements or melting ice, for instance, on land, are leading to uplift of those, those regions above sea level. But for the most part, there is an increase in sea level and some of the places where we see the largest increases such as the Chesapeake Bay region in Maryland or area along the Gulf Coast, we see very high rates of change in terms of relative sea level. And these are in part due to the fact that these areas are actually, the land is sinking in these places. So relative sea level change is, is greater here. Now globally, we see that sea level has increased since 1901 by around eight inches. And so you can compare that to what we see in some of these areas like uh, around the, the Gulf Coast where there's been an increase in relative sea change of eight inches since 1950. So that's at a much higher rate. But globally, uh, sea level is, is rising. And this, of course, is a problem for many countries, including the U.S., where many major cities are located on the coast. Um, something like 40% of Americans live in a city on the coast, and most people live in states that have some coastal area. Now, as the global temperature increases, we expect all places to start experiencing warmer temperatures. However, it's important to realize that warming is not evenly distributed across terrestrial systems. And in some places, if we just look at changes in temperature, so here we're looking at 
relative changes in the average temperature from the period of 1901 to 1931 versus the temperatures during 1981 through 2010. Uh, so what are the, the, the change in temperature? You'll see that it depends on your location and it also depends on the time of year. So the main trends here are that we see the greatest warming in higher latitudes in the Northern Hemisphere. So places like the Arctic have experienced much uh, more warming than other locations on the planet. The other thing to note is that if you compare winter temperatures, changes in winter temperatures to changes in summer temperatures, the summer temperatures on the bottom here, they're pretty evenly distributed uh, for the most part, and they're not so large, but the largest changes in temperature are occurring in the winter. So warming is greatest in the winter and it's also greatest in high latitude areas. Another way that we can look at how warming has been disproportionate across the globe is to just look at the United States and look at how temperatures have changed just over the last century, which is what is shown here on the left. And if we zoom in on the Southeast, you'll see that actually a lot of the Southeast, uh, including Arkansas, has actually experienced a slight cooling trend over the last hundred years, as opposed to a warming trend, which we see throughout most of the United States. And if we look at the mean temperature in Arkansas here on the right, you can see that this again, that's over this whole period from 1895 to 2015, there isn't much of an overall trend. Arkansas hasn't really warmed, but more recently, at least, if you look from 1975 onward, we have been on a sort of steady uh, increase, although slight increase in temperature. And of course, we can expect that con to continue uh, as we continue to burn fossil fuels. Now, warming has also affected precipitation. It's not just temperature that is changing, uh, but just like warming, effects on precipitation are not uniformly distributed across the planet. Uh, but if we think about how precipitation could change as the temperatures increase, remember that the water holding capacity of air depends on the temperature of air and warmer air can potentially hold more water. So it, there is at least a capacity for there to be more water in water vapor in the air at any one time. And that means that in some places, at least, we could see more water falling out of the air as rain. Um, but that is only predicted to happen in some places. So if we look at what the precipitation trends have been thus far, uh, this is what this graph shows. We're looking at the average precipitation that areas have experienced between 1986 through 2015, so more recently, relative to what they were experiencing for the first 60 years of the 20th century. And the blue to green colors represent an increase in precipitation, while the tan to red or dark brown colors indicate a reduction in precipitation. And so one of the troubling things is that while lots of places are predicted to see an increase in precipitation, some places that are already quite dry, so the southwest of the United States, the northern part of Africa, the Middle East, and some of the drier portions of Australia, uh, along with large portions of the Amazon, these areas are anticipated to experience more losses of precipitation over time. And as we can see from this graph, they're already experiencing those reductions in precipitation. So those are areas, a lot of them are already quite water stressed. And so this additional loss of precipitation 
could uh, be very problematic, particularly for people who live in those regions as we think about what that loss of water could mean for food production and the availability of drinking water. And looking at changes in precipitation that we have seen already in the United States, uh, you can see that just as we saw for temperature, change in annual precipitation is not going to be uniform over the whole year. And so if we look at the area for Arkansas, for instance, you can see that summer tends to have gotten drier over time if we look at you know early part of the 20th century versus more recent levels of precipitation. Those brown and tan colors represent a reduction in summer precipitation. However, if you look at the map for fall, well, fall has actually gotten a lot wetter uh, over more recent years. So precipitation is not going to be uniformly affected throughout the year. And in fact, one important thing we need to keep track of is not just the change in the total amount of rain, but how it's distributed across different precipitation events. And this is one big impact of warming that people are very much concerned about is that not only is it projected that for some places there might be a change in the total amount of rain, but even in places where we predict no real change in the amount of rain over a, a year, we still are projecting that the size of rain events is going to to change. And this has consequences uh, for people and environments. So here we're looking at a graph that is showing a projected change in the number of days with a given amount of rain um, for a given climate change scenario where we assume that CO2 emissions aren't controlled much. So it's one of these higher CO2 emissions scenarios that lead to a little bit more warming and as displayed here, also leads to a change in how rain gets distributed across different days. So along the x-axis here, we have a measure of the size of rain events, where from the left to the right, we're seeing an increasing size of precipitation event. So on the very left, no precipitation means the, uh, it's a day without rain, no rain. Zero to 10 means this is the 10% smallest rain event, so smallest amount of precipitation, whereas greater than 95% means that days that have really large amounts of rain, these are the sort of really big rain events. And the y-axis here is showing how the number of days is predicted to change by the end of the century under this particular uh, climate change scenario. And the thing to note is, okay, what's the main pattern? Well, on average, we expect that there are going to be an increase in the number of days where we see no to very little rain. Um, but there will be a decrease in the number of days with moderate amounts of rain. And there's going to be a increase, a pretty large increase in more extreme rain events. So we're going to see more days with large amounts of rain or no to very little amounts of rain and fewer days with intermediate or moderate amounts of rain. Now, why does that matter? What is the effect of this change in the distribution of precipitation events? Well, on the one hand, having more days where you have a lot of rain, that's likely going to mean you're going to have more floods. You're just inundating areas with a huge amount of water at one time, and that will lead to water buildup and flooding. On the other hand, more days with small to no rain means that you're going to tend to have longer periods of time where you don't get any rain, and that could increase the potential for drought. Increases in the chance of drought uh, are not just going to result from changes in the size of precipitation events. Uh, there are other reasons why global climate change is going to lead to an increased frequency of drought. 
And we can see this by looking at some maps of projected change in soil moisture uh, for North America um, at different times of the year. And so one thing I want you to focus on here is that particularly in the summer, spring, and fall, most areas in North America, particularly in the continental U.S., are projected to see a decrease in soil moisture, which is, of course, going to be important for plants and agriculture because water availability is one of the most common limiting factors affecting primary productivity. Now, you might say, well, why is soil moisture expected to decline if we saw that precipitation is not supposed to, to decline so wide in such a widespread manner? Well, the reason is that because all of these areas are predicted to have warmer air temperatures as the climate continues to change, even if they're not going to have less precipitation overall, they are going to experience greater evapotranspiration, which is driven by temperature, and that's going to mean there's less water left over in the soil. So one important thing to keep in mind is that a warmer future is a drier future, even if we don't have changes in precipitation accompanying that uh, change in temperature.